Once again, thank you so much. I appreciate you attending tonight's talk. This is our last talk in our Discover History series. Tonight, we are going to learn about the designed landscape legacy of Camden and Rockport, Maine. And our speaker this evening is Eleanor Noni Ames. So let me tell you a little bit about Eleanor before we begin. So Eleanor Ames has served as the co-chair of the National Association for Olmsted Parks and founded the Maine Olmsted Alliance for Parks and Landscapes which was incorporated into the Maine Historical Society in Portland a decade ago. She is a resident of Rockport and she is going to tell us about how her experience as a landscape designer and historian has informed this talk tonight. Eleanor, you can unmute yourself and take it away. Thank you and thank you, Julia. Uh, the historic design landscapes of Camden and Rockport, we have an amazing rich history of landscape design here in the mid coast. This evening, I thought I would do an overview of early landscape design work in the state of Maine, because there was a lot done here at the beginning of the 20th century. I would then focus on Camden and Rockport, and then end with an exploration of the design construction and the 2004 restoration rehabilitation of the Library Theater and Harbor Park. I start. And before we begin, I did want to mention to folks that we will be taking questions tonight at the end of the program. And if you have any questions for Noni, please go ahead and type them in to the Q&A box, which you can find down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's a little icon. Just go ahead and type them in there, and I'll read them aloud. Thank you, Noni. Please proceed. Great. Okie doke. Well, the rich landscape legacy here in Camden and Rock Rockport was in large part the result of the blossoming of Maine summer communities at the turn of the 20th century, in large part along the coast. There were pockets of these summer communities uh, where rusticators, they were called, came to summer. Mount Desert, Camden and Rockport, Falmouth, Prout's Neck, York Harbor, all had summer communities that were vibrant and families from Philadelphia, Boston, New York, Cincinnati came for the summer and they brought with them their aesthetic values and experiences. Over time, these residents commissioned professionals to design cottages and the grounds of their private estates. But who were these professionals? We really need to begin with Frederick Law Olmsted senior, when in 1858, he and his partner Calvert Vaux designed, won the design competition for Central Park, known as the Greensward Plan. He is considered the father of the profession of landscape architecture. And for over 100 years, the firm he founded was involved in over 5,000 landscape projects in the United States. His sons, became partners, worked with him, and then carried the firm on after Olmsted died. This is John Charles Olmsted. This is Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., known as Rick. And this is Olmsted in his later years. After his death in 1903, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr.'s philosophies and design principles continued to, to guide the firm over the years and really forever changed the face of America. For almost 50 years, there's been an ongoing effort to preserve and protect many of these places, particularly public parks, and to understand the role they play in our lives. Along with the Olmsteads, Maine was lucky enough to have some of the most talented landscape professionals in the country designing private estates, public parks, college campuses, church grounds, golf courses, cemeteries, and even subdivisions. I want to give you a few examples. Unfortunately, I don't have photographs for some of them, so you just have to sort of use your imagination. I'm sure many of you have been to these places. Uh, the summer community of Mount Desert. Beatrix Ferrand, uh, a landscape architect, the first woman uh, to she helped found the American Society for Landscape Architects. She was from New York, 
and she designed many private gardens in North, in Mount Desert, Northeast Harbor, Seal Harbor, but the one that she's really known for uh, is the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Garden in Seal Harbor, which is in a great state of, of preservation, and you can even go and visit there. Jens Jensen, his only work in the East, he, he was from the Midwest, he was a Dane, he did, he, designed the grounds of Skyland, which is in Seal Harbor, the great Edsel Ford estate. And for me, it's about my favorite landscape in the whole state of Maine. It's absolutely beautiful. Frederick Olmsted Jr. worked in collaboration with John D. Rockefeller Jr. to design and lay out the motor roads in Acadia National Park. There were cities that, that had design work done. This is the city of Portland, a plan that the Olmsted brothers uh, did in, I believe, 1905. It combined, it was a park system. James Finney Baxter had gone to Boston. He knew about the emerald necklace designed by the Olmsted firm. And he came back and he wanted to put together a park system. And so he hired the Olmsted and they incorporated three historic parks and then designed a linear park around Back Cove, which is actually the most used park in the whole city of Portland. In Augusta, the state capital, the Olmsted firm was hired to commission to design the State House grounds, Capitol Park, which runs in front of the Capitol building all the way down to the river. And across the street to the right in this slide is the governor's mansion, the Blaine House, which the Olmsted firm designed. And about 20 years ago, there was a great restoration effort, not restoration, but actually rehabilitation of the grounds. And that too, can all these can be visited. Coming to Camden and Rockport, there were numerous landscape architects who worked here. The first one I'll dis discuss is Hans Heistedt. He was a Norwegian who came to the United States and settled in Rockport in 1910. He worked, he worked over time with the Olmsteads, but he was hired by John Grebel to design his private grounds out at Weather End. Heistedt designed a perimeter walk all the way around the, um, the point, he designed terrace levels with masonry walls and wooden furniture that, would, that he placed in all these wonderful little nooks and crannies. He also designed Beechnut, which I'm sure many of you have been to. This was a property on top of, uh, on Beach Hill that John Grebel owned and in order to employ men during the depression, this was, this, was a, this was a project that was built, designed by Heistead. It's, it's really a little Norwegian hut. It was for a tea house. The family would come up and have picnics, tea parties. The roof, the sod roof is still there. It's in a wonderful state of preservation. The, um, it was restored about 10 years ago by the Coastal Mountains Land Trust, and it's wonderful. This was Rockport Harbor at the turn of the century. The Rockport Harbor Improvement Project was 1930 to 1940. Mrs. Bach, Mary Louise Curtis Bach, hired the Olmsted brothers to do, quote, a renovation which was mainly that of recovering the original condition of the rocky shore from its present condition of disused commercial shorefront. Shanties were torn down and property was acquired by Mrs. Bach. This was an industrial site, mainly of the lime kilns, uh, as well as a lot of shipbuilding. She bought 
a lot of the property she re it was it was rehabilitated oh dear my face is in where the bridge is the old metal bridge um a new parking area was planned a reconditioned shorefront and native plantings mrs bach owned six properties along mechanic street she had purchased them they were all re reconditioned and Hans Heisted was responsible for the plantings on those properties. These were, these were properties that in the summer, Mrs. Bach brought up musicians from the Curtis Institute to summer there with their students. And it really became a tradition of music in Rockport. This is Rockport Harbor today. Marine Park is a wonderful, wonderful park right on the harbor. People get on their boats there. Uh, they come down and they picnic. And along, you can see really the edge on the photo on the left. That's the beginning of Mechanic Street. And all along that west side of the harbor, that's where a lot of the properties that Mrs. Bach owned and, and completely um, rehabilitated uh, for her private use. Moving on, Warren Manning was another very, very talented landscape architect who did work in Rockport. He was really a great plantsman and prepared hundreds of planning plans for the Olmsted brothers. He, did, he prepared 30 plans in the, for, the, for projects in the state of Maine. Manning declared, quote, to protect and establish an approach to planning design, emulating the natural landscape is of the essence. He's really known for his naturalistic and wild gardens. This is an old image, old postcard view of the McGonagall Golf Club. He laid out the grounds as well as the golf course and I think it's an excellent example of a naturalistic landscape. <clears throat> the appearance of the grounds belies the fact that much of the course is man-made, which is when you see it today, it's really hard to believe that it was really created by man. There's a present view today. Half, half of the year, the public is allowed to go on the, on the golf course and use it for cross-country skiing or walking. It's a wonderful resource. And last but not least, another landscape architect who did a beautiful property in Rockport. I, for some reason, don't have a picture of it. It was Henry Wheelwright from Philadelphia who designed the gardens of Spite House out on Beauchamp Point. I come now to the Olmsted brother firm, brothers. They did more projects in Camden and Rockport than any other area in the state of Maine. And mostly it was due to the patronage, vision, and generosity of Mary Louise Curtis Bach. Mrs. Bach was Philadelphia born. Her father was Cyrus Curtis, who founded the Curtis Publishing Company she married Edward Bach, who was the editor of the Saturday Evening Post. She founded the Curtis Institute of Music. There's Mrs. Bach. And she felt that there wasn't, a, there wasn't a publication that really addressed women's issues. So she began the Ladies Home Journal. She was a great patron of music and of the arts. And as I said, in Rockport, where she lived, where she grew up at Lindenwood and then moved next door to Nimaha when she was married, she had her musician, the, some, the talented musicians from the Curtis Institute come and summer. And there were concerts in a barn along Pascal Avenue each week. She spent her summers here. She had a great passion for the area. And she really exemplified, exemplified the best of civic-minded commitment. She desired to beautify harbor landings 
and public spaces to quote, bring out the best that is Camden and environs. She often purchased important pieces of land for some of the projects she commissioned. She paid not only for the design work, but for the construction. All construction work was to be done by local labor. That meant Camden and Rockport. Nobody could come from other places and work on her projects, not even Rockland. So she felt she was really helping the people of her, these towns and during the depression. She was, she was committed to improving public spaces for the enjoyment of the whole community. When in 1927, she commissioned the Olmsted, Olmsted Jr., better known as Rick, requesting design services to improve a quote, an open lot by purchased by four residents to save for a park. A 30 year relationship with the Olmsted brothers began and Camden's public spaces were to be enriched by her generosity, <clears throat> excuse me, for generations. This is the village green. That was her first project. I will mention, it's important to mention, Frederick L. Olmsted Jr., better known as Rick. He was not only a landscape architect, he was a city planner. As such, he was a member of the Macmillan Commission for which he developed the plan for the mall in Washington, DC, as well as the park system of the District of Columbia. He also wrote the mandate which led to the establishment of our national park system. The decades long relationship and correspondence between Mrs. Bach and, and Rick Olmsted reflects a great respect for both for each other's ideas and vision. The Village Green was, was on a, built on a site that had been an old hotel it had, which had burned down in 1917. The four men and three men and Mrs. Bach purchased it and it was to be designed as a village green. It was to be kept extremely simple in its treatment and the general character of a New England common or village green. It was to be seen from the street, see there. Incorporated, it, it incorporated a single winding path, benches, and a granite and granite fencing. In 1947, a flagpole was commissioned by Mrs. Bach to honor those who had died in war. This was her first gift to the town. And this is the Village Green today. And I must, must uh, compliment the Camden Garden Club who have done a lot of work here over the year. You could see the granite bollards, the fence, the benches that were proposed. And there's a new memorial <clears throat> in the corner set back that was added, I think about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Moving on to the Camden Library Grounds Theater and Harbor Park. I quote Dr. Charles Beveridge. It should be kept in mind that no other town or city in Maine has a legacy of public landscape design that equals that of Camden. With the elegant amphitheater of Fletcher Steel and the simply conceived Harborside Park of Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the town possesses spaces planned by two of the most important American landscape architects of the 20th century. <clears throat> this is both a significant heritage of historic landscape architecture and a beautiful and vibrant element of the physical setting of the town. Dr. Charles Beveridge is the series editor of the Frederick Law Olmsted Papers in Washington. 
He is the Olmsted scholar and a generous friend to all of us in the field. Also, it should be noted that Charlie spent many of his childhood years here in Camden and continues to come to Maine every summer. Fletcher Steele provided the link between Beaux-Arts formal, formalism and modern landscape design. Quoting from Robin Carson's piece in the library theater on the library theater, Fletcher's best works are quote, distinguished by grand spatial mastery, sophisticated historical quotation, inventiveness in planning design and whimsy. Steele wrote himself, and this is just a, one, a wonderful quote, quote, I care much for shape, size, and proportion of the empty air spaces of my gardens and guard them jealously. Planning is chosen to bring out and enhance the size, proportions, and color of the spaces. And the careful, if possible, obvious relation of the garden to the big landscape features is worked over hard. Carving and modeling of the earth, building walls and masonry, which in height and width are varied and curved to harmonize and often repeat the curves of the mountains and the valley in the background is a fascinating profession. I should have called myself a landscape sculptor for that is what I am. The theater, and I call it the garden, I refer to it as the garden theater. That's what Fletcher Steele called it. It's sort of the name has evolved over time, but I like the idea of a garden theater, which means it's elegant and at the same time, uh, timely. The theater is one of Steele's few public projects and is considered a masterful work of art. It's not surprising that it has the designation of a national historic landmark. And I credit the Camden Library trustees and Dave Jackson for making that designation come to fruition. Again, quoting Robin Carson, who wrote the bio, who has written the biography of Fletcher Steele. She says, freed from the traditional Beaux-Arts axial arrangement that laid out garden areas as extensions of buildings, Steele borrowed the idea of the bent axis from new modernist gardens, which he had visited abroad. He then adjusted the open end of the horseshoe until it felt exactly right. He then directed the legions of men with their digging machines and horse-drawn carts to carve this shape into the hillside. I'll show you a few of the construction drawings of the theater. This is as they're beginning to carve out the terraces. You can see the horse-drawn carts. All these men were either from Camden and Rockport. The grading and the stonework, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> began during the winter of 18, 1928 to 1929 with local labor, labor only as Mrs. Bach desired. <clears throat> Here you can see the terraces beginning to come into view. You can even see in the lower left, one of the piers at the entrance. This was a monumental earth moving project. Tree moving, rock moving machines were rented. And you can see, and I love this photograph because <clears throat> the horses have been unhitched, but there's the chair, which rather looked comfy, that lugged this huge stone to the site. Most of the, all the stones were brought to the site as well as the trees. Spruce and arborvitae 
were brought in to provide a soft background, a sense of enclosure to the curved space that was being created. Birch clumps provided light and visual punctuation. Elms and oaks provided the ceiling canopy to the room that Fletcher Steele had created. All the plants came from within 20 miles of, of Camden. Ground cover was used, Euonymus and Heather and Heath, to soften the rock work. Here are more, you can you see the birches have been planted. There's an elm tree you can see just off to the right that was one of the signature pieces of, uh, of this design. The grass has now been planted. And here is a wonderful wide angle lens view of the theater. You can see on the left, these, the um, base of the lamps that were placed there over time. The elm tree is on the right, the birches, the, the rocks, basically broke up the, the lines of the terraces. It really is such a beautiful work of art. On September 12, 1930, the Boston Post reported, a garden theater, the only one of its kind in the country, which combines the ancient beauty of classical Greece with the rug, rugged verdure of the state of Maine, is fast nearing completion at the head of the harbor to serve as a focal point of Camden's efforts to make itself the most attractive town in the state. At the same time Fletcher Steele was designing, had designed the theater, he was designing the library grounds. In 1939, the theater was inaugurated and the first graduation of the high school took place. Over time, as you can see, there have been theatrical uh, productions. This one, I don't know which play this was, but it looks quite wonderful. Uh, there have been weddings now are held there. There continues to be theater there. There's now exercise classes. There are children's readings there. It's just a glorious place that people come to, they're drawn to in town. This project was really of great significance because it represents the only artistic intersection between the Olmsted brothers and Fletcher Steele. And here are some contemporary views. The wonderful, there are two pavilions that actually act from coming up from the harbor. They, they punctuate the entrance to the theater from the head, uh, from the top of the hill in the theater. They basically enclose the theater. These are the lights I mentioned before that hark back. They sort of have a classical feel to them. They were totally restored uh, around 2004. This was, a, this was a total restoration that was undertaken by the library. And it was beautifully done. This is the library building. And because Fletcher Steele bent the axis uh, of putting the theater as a bent, a bent axis, it runs almost at, a, I believe, a 45 degree angle with the building which means it captures beautiful views. These are here again, details of Fletcher's designs, the beautiful lights, umbrella elms, which you proceed under. This is a view from the library grounds down to the harbor. Harbor Park, we move on to Harbor Park was originally called Shorefront Park. Mrs. Bach commissioned Frederick Olmsted Jr. to develop a plan at the head of the harbor. This was to frame the views from the library and the theater. 
some of the plan was never actually carried out, but today it is really quite extraordinary. These are construction drawings of the park. There again, it was depression time. It employed the men. It was a vast undertaking. The construction of the seawall over towards Main Street, as you can see, it's rather an enormous project. Part of the plan was really to frame views both from the harbor and from the, from the theater. Unlike most Olmsted parks, which were usually 300 acres or more, Harbor Park is only about two acres. And it was designed to be a view corridor. The 2004 rehabilitation plan of the park really involved plantings, re, re, pathways were restored, benches were put in. The plantings were really, really thick. They were to block out the view of the street, to pull you in to the park along the pathways, and to bring you down to the shore. And numerous, there are lots of benches. I don't know how many benches are in the park, but there are many of them and they're just wonderful. Wherever you sit, there's a beautiful view. As Dr. Beveridge describes in his piece for the rehabilitation plan, which he wrote, there are five visual services that the park provides. Oops, sorry. This is a view from the library grounds looking down on Harbor Park today. First, it provides an almost perfectly semicircular green foreground for the views from the Palladian window from the library. Second, it provides a foreground for views from the edge of the library grounds along Atlantic Avenue, which is this view. Third, the principal function of the lower section of the park is to frame a vista toward the harbor from the theater. Fourth, the park is a place from which to view the harbor, the planting blocking, unsightly buildings, and the street. Fifth, the park is a spacious green foreground for the view of Mount Batty and Mount McGonagall. These two landscapes, the theater and the park, are really of a piece. They work together. Despite having two different landscape architects, they really work together. The park provide, the Harbor Park provides the view down to the harbor, and Harbor Park provides the view to the theater. Dr. Beveridge wrote, the artistic value and design quality of the amphitheater is more readily evident than is that of Harbor Park. This is partly because Fletcher Steele created designs that were clearly works of art. In contrast, the tradition of the Olmsted firm was to practice the, quote, art to disguise art. Olmsted Sr shape the land of his parks and arrange the plantings so that in the end, the landscape he created would look as though it had always been there. And that philosophy carried through uh, the work of the Olmsted firm <clears throat> for decades. In closing, I think it's very important to reflect on these past almost two years during COVID, understanding how well the public spaces in Camden and Rockport 
have served us and our community so well. They brought us all together outdoors to enjoy the beauty of our towns and our communities. I commend both towns, both Camden and Rockport, for their good stewardship and their commitment to these places, places for everyone to preserve and to protect them for years to come. I encourage everybody to come to the library and you have to come before Friday, the end of Friday, because the exhibit that's on at the Picker Room is really wonderful. The History Center has, has put it on. It uh, has, has a lot more construction drawings of both Harbor Park and the Village Green. It has a uh, wonderful uh, display of the seven S's of Olmsted's uh, philosophy, his, his design principles. And so come in because there's a lot to learn there. And uh, it's just a very, very special uh, exhibit. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Noni. If you would like to go ahead and hit the, um, the stop share screen, we can begin our conversation. And at this point, I invite folks to uh, go ahead and type your questions into the, uh, the Q&A box. We already have several that have come in. Um, before we jump into those, Noni, it is so fascinating to see those old photographs of the construction and imagine the amount of work that was done prior to having modern construction equipment. It's just mind blowing. It's um, amazing, it really is. Truly a feat for sure. Okay, so I'm gonna, we have a lot of questions that have already come in. I'm gonna do my best to get to as many as possible and I'm gonna focus on the ones that are about uh, landscape design first. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, I love all of what you've shown us, but I do have to ask, what did the locals feel about Mrs. Bach and others buying up as much property as they did and designing and implementing their designs to their own tastes. Do you know if there was any animosity towards them? I'm not aware of anything that I've read or heard um, about Mrs. Bach's projects. Uh, I think it's interesting because the world we live in today, I'm sure that what she what accomplished on Rockport Harbor would not be allowed today. I'm sure there'd be renovations, et cetera, but the idea of literally removing, you know, buildings, et cetera, uh, I don't think the, in between environmental issues, et cetera, uh, I don't think that would happen today. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we can only sort of look back on the past and feel very, fortunate that in fact she did undertake she she had nine projects she even did uh, ha, commissioned the Olmsteads to do work on the uh, Camden Yacht Club grounds so she had eight or nine projects that she worked on with with the Olmsteads actually and even Lindenwood was designed by the Olmstead brothers um, I think one could be critical but I don't think then uh, that she was criticized. I think she was seen as a great philanthropist and a passionate uh, lover of the area. And she did do an enormous amount of good work. It, interestingly, the person who I think submitted that question uh, had a follow-up and said, I suppose that her commitment to hire only local labor and the fact that some of what she did was during the depression might have helped modify the feelings of animosity. So I'm sure there was a bit of... <laughs> Quite a bit of gratitude amongst folks in town. Um, all right, we're having some questions come in. Uh, let's see, Anne, Anne, I love this question. I've always wondered what is in the little buildings in the park, uh, we refer to them as the gatehouses. Um, is there even access to the inside of them? Well, actually I was sort of disappointed. I went back and I took some more photographs and for some reason I couldn't get them to come up for this. Um, but if you go and look, they were there, I think Fletcher Steele referred to them as pavilions. I could be wrong. Uh, on the back side of them are these beautiful little tiny 
uh, leaded glass windows. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're stained glass, but they're not stained. They're white stained glass uh, with wonderful little iron, uh, you know, metal, almost urns in the center. They were designed as one was to be used as a ticket booth and the other was for storage. And Fletcher Steel even asked to have metal chairs ordered and they were stored and they still are and they still exist. This was for the graduation of 1931. And one of those pavilions has those 1931 metal chairs uh, in them. So there's storage and they're utilitarian, but no, I don't think you can go in, just open the door and go in. No, you might, no. <laughs> you, might, you might be able to ask whoever's in charge if you could take a sneak peek, but they aren't open to the public. You would be surprised how many times when I'm out there with the concerts, I get people asking, can I just peek inside? And oh, I know. I've, I've never been inside, I would imagine, but I don't know, being Fletcher Steele, Perhaps the interiors were really quite beautiful too, because his his details were were just wonderful. I'll, um, I'll just tell people it's my my secret office space in there. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> okay, so let's get to some of these questions. Um, yes, and somebody mentioned the Camden Shakespeare Company uses them for storage as well. Yes, they do. Um, okay, so Annalise says. Do you anticipate reimagining parts of Camden public park spaces, particularly the library property, to adjust for emerging issues with sea level rise in the harbor? Does Olmsted have heirs who continue to do work in this area or who could carry the baton in these issues? That's a wonderful question. Um, I think, yes, I mean, global warming and waters rising is a huge issue. And certainly Harbor Park, when you go down to the edge of the park, the water is right there. And I don't know if the town has, has begun to address uh, that issue because it's obviously going to be coming this way. Uh, there are a number of landscape architecture firms all over the country. I don't know specifically of one that maybe is working on these issues, but I'm sure uh, one could do research, but it is something that, you know, in its day, it was never, it never was anticipated um, that the sea level would rise. And I think it's something that the town, um, all towns along the coast. I know Portland is, has, a, has a big uh, plan that they're working on uh, because of sea level rise and um, Portland's waterfront will be underwater uh, someday. So it's something I'm sure the town fathers of Camden are beginning to look at, at least I hope so. Um, someone is, at, we, we have a lot of questions that are very similar to that, so I'm, I'm not going to read every single one because it's pretty much, they wanted, folks wanted to know what your take was on um, guessing Olmsted's, um, how Olmsted would have felt about uh, reconfiguring the original design, um, but I, I think you did touch on that, but if you have any further thoughts on it, you're, you're certainly welcome to jump in with those. Um, so someone, Polly's asking, where was the Olmsted farm located or firm? It's, I wasn't oh, sure. Firm. Okay. Oh, and this is something that I think anybody that, that wants to, it's really quite wonderful. Um, on the, the Olmsted lived in Brookline, Massachusetts. He had his office in his house and it's called Fairstead. And Fairstead is the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site in Brookline, Massachusetts. You can visit there. You can see the, the, the studios where they, the associates and the employees worked. Uh, there were a number of them. There is one room that you can visit I think they've, they've taken all the originals out, but it had all the drawings that they had and they were all rolled up and stuffed into it was it was amazing when the national park service 
took over the historic site. Uh, there was a lot to go through and weed through because the firm went well through into the seven, 1970s. Um, so it, it's well worth going to visit. If you're in the Boston area, you can go, you can go visit Fairstead and there's the park service. They have a tour, et cetera. And his, the grounds of the house are really a tiny microcosm of Olmsted's design principles. They're quite wonderful. It's a wonderful property. Well, that, that actually leads me to one of the other questions is what are those design principles? Again, you had mentioned the seven S's. That, oh, they're the uh, seven S's. Yes. And I'm not even, I'll miss a few, but <laughs> they, they are really, they're wonderful. That's why you have to come to the picker, picker room and um, see, but some of them are suitability, uh, separation of ways. If you think of Central Park, if you've been to Central Park, and actually here in Harbor Park, you have pathways and the street obviously doesn't, doesn't affect the park. In Central Park, you have uh, pedestrian walks, you have carriage paths, you have transverse roads, you have park circular roads, and none of them over go across each other, their bridges or their tunnels, where you never ever come in contact with a car or a carriage or whatever if you're on foot. And so separation of ways was really important. One thing to, to which I didn't mention is Olmsted was very much an environmentalist and a conservationist. He understood uh, for instance, the Boston um, Emerald Necklace in Boston, the, all along the Fenway, et cetera, that was really a sanitation project. That's another S, sanitation of sort of improving areas that had the sort of marshy areas that, that were unhealthy uh, for the population. Uh, he did a lot of work that you don't really understand or even see today in these park systems. Um, so the seven S's, I've hit on three. I should, oh, scenery was another one. Um, oh, oh, well, I flunk. It's okay. Ken, you can type in the other ones if you want. And I'll see if I can, if I can read them oh, aloud. Yeah. Ken's <laughs> across from me. He can type them in. Thank you, Ken. All right. Um, William says, how did he express his view of combining uses in the parks to meet the needs of the residents? I worked on Deering Oaks rehabilitation and love his weaving of uses in the design. Oh, that's very, that's very interesting. Um, what, well, what's interesting, and I think this is another point that I really should make, is you have Olmsted Sr., he died in 1903. He had designed a number of parks. He, he, was, he was working on Biltmore Estate when he retired. Um, but it was the Olmsted brothers firm, his sons and associates that carried on. So a lot of the Olmsted work that you see is not Olmsted Sr. It's Olmsted Jr., John Charles, his son, and associates. Deering Oaks Park, interestingly enough, was not designed by the Olmsteads. It was designed by William Goodwin, who was a city engineer in Portland. Uh, Deering Oaks Park was incorporated into the Portland Park System as part of that plan that the Olmsted brothers did. But William Goodwin was very aware of what was going on around the country when he was doing his work, he knew about Olmsted, he knew about what Olmsted was doing. And so the curvilinear paths, the, um, the, the beautiful bridge in Deering Oaks, the little um, concession stand, uh, how it all works uh, was very much according, based on some Olmsted principles. Um, but it's not an Olmsted Park. Most people think it is. Um, we had a question. Someone was curious about what part of Olmsted's plan did not get completed for Harbor Park. You mentioned that some stuff didn't get done. Yeah. There was a big wharf that was proposed that would be at 
obviously at the bottom at the on the water at the bottom of the park and i think it was a combination of perhaps money and desire to continue more work uh, it just never got built hmm. let's see and linda wants to know if you could please spell you'd said dr beverage or dr betridge could you uh, oh, clarify beverage. which that was yeah it's dr charles beverage it's b-e-v-e-r-i-d-g-e Okay. And speaking of spelling, <laughs> one thing, and I wish I'd found it because I had a friend who wrote a poem about it. Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, does not have an A in it. And most times, every time you see Olmsted with an A, it's not correct. There is no A in Olmsted. But your fingers just want to type that A when you type out. Oh, Olmsted. I know. I know. It just doesn't look right without it. And I'll say, actually, it's still in, uh, in, in the family. Felstead is on Deer, Deer Isle, and that was Olmsted's summer house uh, that he came to, Olmsted mm -hmm. Sr. Um, so we have some folks who are curious about landscape architects of today uh, who are doing similar things where they're honoring natural landscapes. Uh, can you talk about anyone um, that you know of that, that is doing anything similar to what we, we saw from Olmsted and some of these other um, folks you've mentioned? Well, I think one thing that's interesting is there is an understanding today, much more so than probably well, a while ago, that native plantings mm. are really basically the way to go. I mean, mm. so many ornamentals have been introduced that haven't done well, or they've taken over um, and, and have become sort of pests. Um, yes, I mean, there, there are some fine landscape architects in the state of Maine. I can think of Stephen Moore, Moore and Saradin. They do a lot of work around the state and um, are very aware of uh, natural, the native plantings, uh, good design technique. Um, it, Maine lagged a bit along the way after all that happened here. Uh, it's been slow. When I moved to Maine in, the, in 1980, there were very few landscape architects in Maine. There wasn't really a demand. But when you think about it, the turn of the, of the 20th century, it was people, say, from Boston who had landscape architects. They brought them to Maine. And so that whole summer colony, that whole idea uh, really changed over time. We have a question that wasn't directly about landscape architecture, but does um, touch on what you just mentioned about, you, you had mentioned at the very beginning of the program, uh, how so many people here, you referred to as rusticators, um, came from the New York and Boston area, but uh, this person is observing that they think that a lot of folks that came from, um, who settled and summered in Camden and Rockport were actually from the Philadelphia area. Oh, there uh, are a lot of, well, yeah. Is there a yeah, reason for that talk. pattern of, of well, you know, it's interesting. There were some that actually came from Chicago also, but I don't, I actually have never really thought about why they came, but they came, they came north or along the East Coast. They came north to Maine. And I think once a few came, they told their friends and then their friends came. And, uh, as they were really establishing themselves in these pockets along the coast, uh, they brought their landscape architects and designers and even architects um, from away came and designed uh, houses and grounds for them. And so I think it was in a way word of mouth after the first rusticators came and I can't tell you who the first rusticators were. But, <laughs> um, it, it, it became sort of maybe a fad. Well, we do have some answers, by the way, to that earlier question. What are those seven S's? Uh, by the way, oh, it's scenery, suitability, style, 
subordination, separation, sanitation, and service. And you can learn about all of them at the Camden Public Library's exhibit up right now. Um, we did have someone mention it, and I do want to say it aloud because I know that this is a big issue in town of how are we going to uh, be dealing with what's, what's happening in the park? How are we dealing with climate change? Um, and this particular person wanted to uh, let you know the listeners know um, that this this issue is not an unattended issue. It is uh, being lively debated right now um, and and all, all points of view are being considered as the best way to um, address this so that um, the parks can be preserved and uh, the realities of, of you know sea rise are happening as well. So um, it is certainly not something that's being swept under the carpet. This is something that, that we are uh, actively addressing in our community um, and look forward to seeing how things turn out. Um, Noni, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It is 7.30, so we can we can go ahead and wrap up. Um, we have a slew of compliments in here, folks thanking you and saying how lucky they feel to live in this area uh, and how wonderful it is to look back at those old images of, of Rockport and Camden and uh, learn a little bit more about our history. Um, I encourage folks also, if you're a local or not a local, please come during the summer and take the historic walking tour with Dave Jackson and Amy Rollins um, all around the library grounds and the historic uh, downtown Camden area. And um, I promise you will learn something new as I hope you have tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, that said, we're going to wrap up our program. If you'd like to share it with friends or family, we have put, we will be putting it uh, by tomorrow morning, probably on the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any difficulty locating that, uh, please let me know, and I'll send you the link. Also, I encourage you to join us for other upcoming library talks. We have a lot of them. We do them most every Tuesday and Thursday, uh, and we talk about everything. Um, and we please visit librarycamden.org slash events and see if you see something on there that looks interesting to you and, and join us again in the future. Noni, once again, thank you so much. We appreciate well, your thank time. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been fun and it put me to work. <laughs> well, we appreciate your expertise. <laughs> all right. I hope you all have a great evening and I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Take care. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>